Stay tuned. Ahead, I'll talk with Susan Kaiser Greenland about real-world enlightenment, discovering ordinary magic in everyday life. Hi, I'm Dan Skinner, and this is Some Books Considered. Susan Kaiser Greenland is a best-selling author, globally recognized mindfulness innovator, leader, and mentor. Her previous books include Mindful Games and The Mindful Child. She joins us to talk about real-world enlightenment and how we can obtain it. Susan, welcome to Some Books Considered. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Well, let's start with the title of the book. What do you mean by enlightenment? Well, I'm talking about a real-world enlightenment. Uh, I'm not really writing about the enlightenment of, of big spiritual traditions, but the bits, the glimpses of everyday enlightenment that all of us can see at any time, at any moment. So I bet you've had that experience too. I bet you've had that experience of when you're walking in nature or what, you're with a young a young child or somebody you love, and all of a sudden your ego drops away and you feel as if you're connected to something far greater. And that's a glimpse. That's a glimpse of the kind of freedom and enlightenment that's available to us all the time, even during tough circumstances. That experience you're talking about, is is that also what sometimes people refer to as a sense of awe? Yes. it's uh, And that connection with nature or other events in your life? Yes. People call it awe. People call it wonder. The mystics called it oneness. This sense that everything is greater than our ego-driven selves. And crazily enough, sometimes we tap into that most during very, very sad times. For those of us who've been privileged to be with people who are dying or quite sick, at those moments, things just drop away and there's really a sense of connection to what's important. And that again is a glimpse of everyday enlightenment that we then can bring into our lives at the DMV, you know, when we're waiting in a long line. Now you've written other books about mindfulness. Uh, I'm curious about what different approach or what different thing that you want to say about this topic that made you want to write this new book? The new book, because Ever since I was a young child, my father was Catholic, my mother was Presbyterian. I grew up and I married a Jewish guy. I have studied Buddhism. I have seen all of the commonalities among these great wisdom traditions. And too often we focus on the and the differences and not on what they have in common. So what I really wanted to do was write a book where we focused on what we have in common. And sure, there's differences, but I think if we can look at what we have in common first, build some bridges, we'll be in a lot better shape to to sort of navigate the differences. Now, before we talk about some of the specific advice you offer in the book, give us a brief overview of the book. What are readers going to find here? We're going to take a look at about 50 different uh universal themes or ideas that cut across all of the different wisdom traditions that lead to a kinder and a wiser and a more compassionate way of navigating the world and a steadier one, ways to navigate and ground our nervous system. So for example, things like interdependence, how everything is connected, things like change, how things are changing all the all of the time. Things like patience, things like kindness. Those are universal themes you see everywhere. And if you talk to people, whether they're scholars or grandma and grandpas who have kind of gone through the school of hard knocks, you ask them what really made them happy or what was their their understanding of happiness, often you'll find it's that they have connected to some of these universal themes, things that are bigger than us. We live, as you note in the book, uh, in a very stressful time. There's lots of political divide. There's concerns about the planet, et cetera, et cetera. How will seeking enlightenment, seeking mindfulness, help us deal with those issues? Well, it's kind of a two-step process. The first step is that the mindfulness-based strategies, the awareness-based strategies help us notice, become aware of when our nervous systems are ratcheted up. And when our nervous systems are ratcheted up, it's a fight or flight response. And our bandwidth goes from a broad bandwidth to a very narrow bandwidth. And we're not able to be very open-minded. We're not able able to be very open-hearted because we're fighting for survival. Even that nervous system can get you know, triggered even again in that long line at the DMV. So there's not really a survival problem, but it feels like there is. 
and everything shrinks. So if we take the mindfulness-based strategies and learn to ground our music, nervous system, and these universal themes that I write about in the book that help us expand our perspective and open our hearts, that will help us be steady even in the midst of challenging situations, because that's really the goal, to stay open-minded and open-hearted even in the midst of life's challenges. Well, there are some obstacles we need to overcome to get there. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk about both of them separately, but I know they're interrelated. And one is the culture that we live in, which is constantly bombarding us <laughs> with information, which seems it's a little hard sometimes to find that quiet you might need to be introspective and to look at the bigger picture. Yeah. Well, that's why we really emphasize in this book, at the end of each chapter, there's a wrap-up section that gives you just a paragraph on what the theme is, a practice, and a one-line takeaway to take out into your life that day, because it's all about brief moments of awareness. Just dropping brief moments of awareness into your day whenever you can remember, whether you're again waiting in line, whether you're chopping carrots at the, at the kitchen sink, whether you're on hold waiting for the telephone company. Um, if when those times that we notice our nervous systems are getting ratcheted up, we pause, interrupt that fight or flight response to settle, lower our shoulders, ground ourselves, and just start to see how then our perspective and our hearts just widen and open. So it's just time and time and time again, dropping brief moments of awareness into stressful times. You mentioned those external factors, but then you also talk about internal factors that we need to get over, including some limiting beliefs that we might have. Tell us more about that. Well, we all have uh, unconscious biases. Everybody does. So the key, again, is awareness. And I've talked about awareness a lot. But once we become aware of how we feel when we're starting to feel our minds narrow a little bit, then we can use those awareness-based strategies to ground ourselves. And then just ask ourselves, what are three different perspectives? Can you just imagine three different ways of looking at this particular situation? And it doesn't take long to start to see that our perspective may be valid, but it's probably not the only one. I'm talking with Susan Kaiser Greenland about real world enlightenment, discovering ordinary magic in everyday life. And our conversation continues in a moment. If you appreciate this discussion, please subscribe, like, and click on the bell so you'll know when I post new interviews. And thank you. As you mentioned, there are 50-some techniques and uh, topics that you cover in this book. To give us a, a taste of the book, could you sort of walk us through maybe one or two of those? Sure. Sure. One of my favorites and one that I get a lot of feedback on is the idea of safety. And this idea that when we don't feel safe, that fight or flight response kicks in because we pay a lot of attention to what scares us. But we very rarely really know the kind of things that we don't feel safe about. So I'll give you an example. I used to think that uh, I needed one thing for safety, but it turns out I really need some structure. And when I don't have structure, I start acting in a way that sometimes steps on other people's toes trying to create that structure. So the practice is to settle yourself again, ground yourself by listening to sounds or you're, or you're feeling your breathing. And then just take a moment to really inquire, what do I need to feel safe? And jot that down and revisit that time and time again. When you start to feel a little bit worked up, wonder, is there something about the situation that doesn't feel safe to me? And once you view it in safety terms, you can think, okay, I really am safe right now. And again, we can settle and ground ourselves. And we've got more awareness of what we can do the next time so that we don't, so that we don't feel unsafe. So there are a lot of different techniques you talk about in the book. I'm wondering how you're envisioning people using the book. Is this a book you read straight through or do you kind of dip in in different topics as it speaks to you? I hope people dip in at different topics to speak to you. Uh, there's the chapters will tell you what the themes are. And then if you just skim to the back of each chapter, there's this wrap up section where in a paragraph, you'll get a sense of the theme and some very specific practices and see how that goes for you. If something lands, try it and then maybe read the full chapter 
Or if you're like somebody who just likes reading the book or listening to Audible, you can go through it like any other book. It seems to me it's the kind of book that because the way it's designed that you would want to read one portion and then take the time to reflect on that and then maybe try it out and see how that works for you in your life. That would be terrific. And that also, it's great to go to what resonates with you because that's true with all of these awareness practices. Some things land with some people, some things don't. But if you go through each chapter, I hope you'll find some things that land. So how do you envision this sort of working in a person's everyday life? You know, there are specific things, as you point out, that a person can look at, but in terms of sort of incorporating that into their daily existence, how do you envision that? It's those brief moments of awareness again. And I've seen this happen in my own life and in countless number of people that I've coached and that I've worked with and I've taught over decades now. These practices really are effective and they just take a little bit of time to integrate. So once you get out of the habit of running on automatic pilot, or once you start noticing, okay, I'm on automatic pilot, ever read a book and go five pages and realize you didn't, didn't remember anything? So you're someplace else. You don't beat yourself up about it. It happens to everybody, but you interrupt that pattern and you drop in this brief moment of awareness and then go back and start again. Because that's the beauty of this work. You can always begin again. And when we do that over and over again, we start to change the neural pathways in our brain. We can change, but it takes just gentle, kind, compassionate, repeated effort. And like I said, little bits, little bits, just brief moments of awareness. So it sounds like this needs to eventually just become a habit, something you do throughout the day. You take those moments to be aware of your surroundings, take those moments to uh, appreciate maybe uh, the clouds in the sky that day or the sounds of the birds yeah. or, or whatever it might be. And, and if you do that all the time, then it sounds like that's going to enrich your life. It, it does. And I've seen it over and over again. It's surprising how quickly you start to see the shift. And just as you said, how quickly it starts when you start interrupting patterns where you're not feeling so good, but pretty quickly you start interrupting your walk because you see a flower that's gorgeous or because you just want to sit back and take in the sunset or take in the water. So all of those things help us stop and, you know, the old fashioned about it, smell the roses. Now, I imagine someone might be listening to this and thinking, yeah, yeah, that sounds great, but, you know, enlightenment, you know, is that really something I can do? So based on your experience, is that something that anyone can do? Absolutely. And it's not only something that anybody can do, it's something that my guess is everybody has already experienced. This real world enlightenment is just a glimpse of those moments, those aha moments where everything drops away right? And you just feel, wow, something really magical is going on. And once you taste that, once you taste that feeling, even in tough times, you can remember that that may come again. And you believe it because you've tasted it before. Well, there's more in this book that we don't have time to talk about. What would you say are the key concepts that you people will take from the book? I hope that people take from the book that if somebody like me, who's just a regular person with a family and with all the stresses that come with it, can use these practices to enrich my life and remembering that there's a ripple effect. So when I'm a little less neurotic, when I'm a little bit upset, less upset, people around us also feel a little better. That if somebody like me can do it, then you can too. That's what I want people to take away. To learn more, the book is Real World Enlightenment, Discovering Ordinary Magic in Everyday Life by Susan Kaiser Greenland. Susan, thank you for talking with me today. Thank you. I really appreciate it. If you'd like to purchase Real World Enlightenment, I've placed a link for you in the description below. And if you'd like to see more videos about books and their authors on a wide variety of topics, be sure to subscribe, like, and click on the bell to be notified about future programs. I'm Dan Skinner. Thank you for watching this edition of Some Books Considered. <laughs>